Karmendriyani Samyamya Yaste Manasa Sam Smaran Indriyarthan Bimudhatma Mithyachara Sauchyate One who restrains the sense of senses of action, but whose mind dwells in on sense objects, certainly deludes himself and is called a pretender. There are many pretenders who refuse to work in Krishna consciousness, but make a show of med meditation. While actually dwelling within the mind upon sense enjoyment. Such pre pretenders may also speak on dry philosophy in order to bluff sophisticated followers. But according to this verse, these are greatest cheaters. For sense enjoyment, one can act in any capacity of the social order. But if one follows the rules and regulations of his particular status, he can make gradual process in purifying his existence. But he who makes a small a show of being a yogi while actually searching for the objects of sense gratification must be called called the greatest cheater. Even though he sometimes speaks of philosophy, his knowledge has no value because the effects of such a sinful man's knowledge are taken away by the illusory energy of the Lord. Such a pretender's mind is always impure and therefore his show of yogic meditation has no value whatsoever. Chai Shila Prabhupada. Mm -hmm. So, Lord Krishna is describing the nature that there are people who make a show, pretend to be engaged in spiritual activities, but their purpose is not for self-realization. Their mind is absorbed thinking only of sense gratification. So the word there is mityachara, mityachara, pretender, right? They're not genuine in their efforts for practicing meditation or yoga. So very important, one should be straightforward and genuine. We know there are many difficulties on the path of self-realization. So Prabhupada explains if one simply follows his ashram and his varna, does his duty, then he can make progress and purify his existence. He does what he's supposed to do according to his ashram and varna, performs his duty, so by doing that, he can make progress. Not that one has to be renounced. Not that one has to change the dress and go and live in a cave and, or, you know, be sitting, chanting and showing people what a great devotee you are. No, one has to be, one should be a normal person, live in the world and perform a duty and you, just by doing that, you can make progress. Gradually, you can purify ourselves. But if somebody abruptly tries to renounce the world, and tries to make a show of his spiritual advancement, then that can create problems because the person is not very genuine. So his mind is always thinking of sense gratification. So, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, the spiritual master of our founder Acharya, Srila Prabhupada, he wrote a poem, quite a long poem, about this problem. Right? And he talks, he's addressing, he says, Tumi Kishera Vaishnava, what kind of Vaishnava are you? Uh, Tumi Kishera Vaishnava, 
pratishtana kari nirchanera gari tabahari nam kevala kaito. I think it's Bengali, right? So he's, he's addressing yes. the mind. He's addressing the mind that what kind of Vaishnava are you? That just for this pratishta, pratishta means getting respect from others. And you want to go and sit in a cave and you want people to know how advanced you are. So you renounce it, you, 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 but you're just doing this to get adoration, just to get distinction. You just want people to respect you. So there was a case, uh, what happened, there was one young Western body devotee, he was given sannyas by Srila Prabhupada. And uh, after he was given sannyas, you know, Prabhupada gave him the sannyasi rod, the tridandi. So he was going around, he was in Vrindavan and he was going around, but he came back after some time and he said to Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, I don't like this. He said, wherever I go, people are bowing down to me. They're all respecting me. But Srila Prabhupada said to him, he said, oh, don't be silly. They're not bowing to you. They're bowing to what you represent. So this is the point that uh, be becoming an, a, a renounced person or, a, you know, uh, some kind of yogi or meditator, people are not just respecting the person, but they're respecting what they expect from that kind of person. That they think of him as being genuine, that someone who's detached from the material world. And if someone has not actually detached himself from the material world, then it's cheating, then it's not genuine. And so, this is the idea that when we respect the renounced person, it's because they represent renunciation. It's not just that person in particular, but it's what they represent, which is being respected. Any questions? Any comments? Hare Krishna Maharaj. In the uh, in the yoga ladder, we have the karma yoga, the jnana yoga, astanga yoga, and bhakti yoga. Where does uh, sankhya yoga fit in in the ladder, Maharaj? Well, sankhya yoga would be jnana yoga. Okay, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Yeah, yesterday night we, we discussed uh, about uh, uh, taking sannyasa and the uh, uh, prescribed duties and, and the varnas and uh, it was very interesting last night, the meeting we had. And uh, that it was not needed to uh, accelerate the process. First you are brahmachari after you get married. And finally, when you are, you are going when through all this, you, you may take sannyas. And my question is, shall we take sannyas at the point of our life? Or, so it's an obligation or you can... Uh, no, sannyas, uh, is, sannyas is not for everyone. Sannyas is meant to be for those people who are particularly uh, Brahmin, on the Brahmin, they're, they're working more as Brahmanas, you know, Kshatriya and Vaishya people, they wouldn't take sannyas. But somebody mm -hmm. who is dedicated to the Brahminical work, you know, preaching and writing and like that, then that kind of person, then they may think. It, it, so sannyas is meant for the the best of the, the brahmanas, not even all brahmanas will take sannyas, but those who are particularly inclined to do propaganda work, they're meant to go out for preaching. So in the, in the Kali Yuga, the sannyas ashram is meant for that kind of work, that they will go around 
and do preaching work and make propaganda for the, you know, for the path of devotion and for the worship of Krishna. They'll go everywhere speaking about Krishna. And so sannyas is uh, the final stage. But like I say, it's, it's not for everyone. Yes. But you see, one can be a sannyasi also internally without externally going through all the the things of changing the dress and carrying the rod of the sannyasi. And of course, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu shaved his head, you know. So you can be you can be very renounced. Actually, Prabhupada writes in one purport in the Bhagavad Gita, I think it's chapter 16, and he said uh, there are there are a number of householders in the Krishna consciousness movement who are working in factories and in offices, and they com they contribute a major portion of their earnings for the Krishna consciousness movement. And Prabhupada then says, such devotees are actually in the renounced order of life. They are actually sannyasis, although externally they're householders and they're working in jobs, but because they're so detached from enjoying material world, because they're so dedicated to Krishna, they're actually sannyasis. And you see also how Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he was a householder with a, a large number of children. And he had married twice. The first wife had died, so he married again. And so he's described as being the seventh Goswami. There were six Goswamis in Vrindavan, but Bhaktivinoda Thakur is described as being the seventh Goswami because he was so dedicated to the service of Krishna. Right? He discovered the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and he wrote so many wonderful songs and wonderful books about Krishna consciousness and he preached a lot. He went everywhere preaching. He established the Nam Hatha preaching. Hmm? So it's not that, you know, sannyas means simply change in dress. The real sannyas is the one who works without attachment to the results. Right? One who is not attached. So you, you may live with the family, you may be actually you may actually be sannyasi. And we see Ambarish Maharaj in our Puran in our scriptures, the example Ambarish Maharaj, he was greater than Durvasa Muni. He was so renounced. But he was a family man, he was a materialistic. Externally he appears materialistic. But he was really detached, really renounced, genuinely renounced. All right? Yes, yes, very, very nice, very clear. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Three point seven. Uh, Simon Prabhu, do you want to read the verse? Three point seven. Ramya Mataji, do you want to read it? 
கர்மயோக in krishna consciousness without attachment he is by far superior puppet instead of becoming a pseudo transcendentalist for the sake of wanton living and sense enjoyment it is far better to remain in one's own business and execute the purpose of life which is to get free from material bondage and enter into the kingdom of god the prime swartagati or goal of self interest is to reach vishnu the whole institution of varna and ashrama is designed to help us reach this goal of life a householder can also reach this destination by regulated service in krishna consciousness for self realization one can live a controlled life as prescribed in the shastras and continue carrying out his business without attachment and in that way make progress a sincere person who follows this method is far better situated than the false pretender who adopt show bottle spiritualization specialization to cheat the innocent public a sincere sweeper in the sweet street is far better than the charlatan meditator who meditates only for the sake of making a living hari krishna all right so very important message but, but after hearing about the pretender now Lord Krishna is describing the genuine person, the sincere person. First of all, he tries to control the senses by the mind. You have to use the mind to control the senses, right? Higher than the senses is the mind. So the mind is meant to control the senses and we have to work. And the work means karma yoga without attachment. working in krishna consciousness without attachment so karma yoga i was explaining you know that in the beginning we may not have much taste for bhakti yoga bhakti yoga means hearing and chanting and worshiping the deity in these things you know we naturally in the beginning we don't have a lot of appreciation for these things because we are conditioned to the material world but at the same time we are attracted and we want to begin our spiritual path we want to go on the spiritual journey so we begin we learn how to do this karma yoga right begin working in krishna consciousness without attachment karma yoga means without attachment and so we are able to work in that kind of manner then this is very conducive very helpful for self realization without attachment naturally you you doing if you say if you're doing some business or something you want to make some profit <laughs> there's no profit then how can you do the business so no attachment what does it mean means ultimately we have to depend on krishna that we have to understand we're not the doer and whatever happens we should think a devotee thinks it's the results of my past activities somehow maybe due to my past i did some pious activities so krishna is making my life easier i have everything i need i'm very comfortable very sat krishna is encouraging me i don't deserve so much but krishna is encouraging me and when things are going bad and you're losing everything we think i'm such a rascal i deserve to suffer much more 
but Krishna is only giving me a token punishment. Krishna has reduced the punish, reduced the suffering. And so that's Krishna's kindness on me. So the devotee sees everything, the arrangement of Krishna. Doesn't think it's by my intelligence, I'm successful, I made a lot of money by my hard work, by my intelligence. No, that's not how devotee will think. The devotee understands it's the mercy of Krishna. So Krishna may be kind, he may be, he may be punishing us, but it's Krishna's mercy. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So we depend on Krishna and see Krishna, Krishna is the cause. So Prabhupada says, better to be a sincere sweeper, <laughs> right? He gives the example, somebody may be sweeper in the street, but he's sincere, he's genuine, he's honest. And he understands, you know, somehow due to my past karma, I'm in this situation, Krishna has given me this job as a sweeper in the street. It's somehow, this is the karma from my past activities, let me go on and do my duty. We know it's not eternal. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Any question, comment? Anybody? Guru Maharaj, are we doing karma yoga or bhakti yoga, Guru Maharaj? Well? Ah, uh, yeah. How to know if what I am doing, Guru Maharaj, means... Uh, Well, in karma yoga, we work for, first, we work in a particular way and we offer the result to Krishna. After. So the surrender comes later. We didn't surrender in the beginning, but later we surrender something of the result. But in bhakti yoga, bhakti yoga begins with surrender. And then we're, will, we, we're will, willing to do anything for Krishna. Whatever Krishna wants us to do, we'll do. We don't just think, oh, I want to do this, I don't like to do that. No, I don't like cooking, I just want to be the pujari, or I just want to sing kirtan. No, a devotee will do whatever Krishna wants him to do. That's surrender, bhakti yoga, have to surrender. But we also say bhakti yoga usually means the nine kinds, the nine angas, beginning with shravanam, kirtan, you know, hearing and chanting and remembering, and then worshipping the lotus feet and offering prayers, and then uh, becoming Krishna's friend and surrendering everything. And doing things like, yeah, worship, sacrifice, performing these kind of things. This is bhakti yoga. But mainly we give the emphasis on hearing and chanting. Very important. And from hearing and chanting, then everything develops. But to become Krishna's friend and to surrender everything, that comes later. That's very, very advanced bhakti yoga. We have to make the foundation strong. And the foundation of the bhakti yoga is with hearing and chanting. But karma yoga is all about work. <laughs> work, work, work. <laughs> and offer the results to Krishna. 
try to offer something to Krishna. In the Bhagavad Gita, in the 12th chapter, Lord Krishna discusses different levels of doing yoga. So first of all, he tells Arjuna, just think of me and without deviation. I said, that's the highest. So if you, can't, if you can't do that, then he says, then perform the regulative principles of bhakti yoga. And then in the purple, Prabhupada explains what is meant by bhakti yoga. He says, uh, you worship the deity every day, you offer RT, and you uh, study Srimad Bhagavatam, and you chant japa, and you cook for Krishna and offer everything to Krishna. So this is bhakti yoga. These are the regulated principles of bhakti yoga. But karma yoga, you, you know, do your job, you know, you're working, you have a job, you do, or you're a housewife, street dharma, that's also, you know, it could, it could be back to yoga, but usually it's karma yoga. Okay, Guru Maharaj. Guru Maharaj, I have a question. Mm -hmm. You said uh, you might be a housewife, so it's actually my example. I am a homemaker, so I'm. Am I? Am I into karma yoga? Well, you have to consider how much you do hearing and chanting. How much time in the day do you spend hearing and chanting? Okay, it's. Not very much, maybe two, two, two hours, two to three hours. Every day. No, sometimes I miss that. Yeah. So probably you're more karma, a karma yogi than. <laughs> <laughs> so please bless me. I, I can change that. That can be changed. Yeah. Well, karma yogis are also very close to bhakti yoga, you see. It's very close to bhakti yoga. The more you're detached from the results, then the closer you are to bhakti yoga. Okay. I have a question, Prabhu. Yes. If if a karma yogi is karma is to serve the bhakti yogis, then what kind of um, yogi is that karma yogi? Like, if my karma is to serve bhakt people who are bhaktas. Oh, that's very good karma. You're very fortunate to get the opportunity to serve the devotees. That's very, very special. You get a lot of benefit by serving the devotees. We see like Narada Muni in the Srimad Bhagavatam, the story is given about Narada Muni, how he was the son of a maidservant in a previous life. And he served some holy man who came to his house. And so shortly after that, because they stayed there at his house for some time, so he was serving them regularly. And he was hearing from them and they taught him things and he even ate some of their remnants. So next life, Narada Muni became the son of Brahma mm -hmm. because he had so much good association with the devotees and because he had the blessings from these devotees. So if you can serve the devotees, then it's very, very special. We say, by serving the devotees, it opens the doors to liberation. So, yes, you're very fortunate to serve the devotees. So in that case, Prabhu, if a household is full of dev devotees and um, the homemakers in that house are actually very elevated devotees, by, because they're serving them. Yes. Yes, if people in your house are devotees, you're very fortunate. Yeah, you get a lot of association and you get a lot of opportunity to serve devotees. But Guru Maharaj, 
uh, most of the time uh, the devote uh, family members are not devotees mata ji is get initiation but the husband is not a devotee but uh, sri dharma we have to serve them right guru maharaj for the pleasure of krishna we have to do like that how how to serve the non devotees for the pleasure of krishna guru maharaj well we have to <laughs> give them nice prasadam <laughs> right keep them happy by giving them some nice food stuffs and what's offered to krishna and we try to give them some mercy awakening them to krishna consciousness hmm. sometimes on a big festival you take them to the temple and come bring them to the program and get them you know actually we say also that the the husband and wife you see their karmas are combined you see so the the husband enjoys the pious activities of the wife and the wife also enjoys pious activities of the husband but if they do something sinful then they can also suffer you know if the husband does something sinful it can also affect the wife so you is very important to try to encourage your husband you know, not to do sinful things you know not to get intoxicated not to eat meat and things like that you know it's really important because otherwise that also affects you because you know husband and wife the we say wife is the better half of the husband is described like that in one of prabhupada's purports that the wife is the better half of the husband because she helps the husband with all of his different problem different things he has to do in his life the wife is very important to the husband it helps to take care of the home gives him nice meals and keeps him company and so on so this is all very important so the their karmas are interrelated so you do want to try to encourage your husband and if he has any bad habits you want to discourage him from these bad habits yeah but in that case guru maharaj uh, uh, but if it is not possible then uh, they cannot they can never lead a sinless life if the, most of the time sometimes uh, yeah we we can try to discourage but uh, it won't happen and uh, then uh, then there is no choice for the other partner to have a sinless life well <laughs> you have to you have to see what krishna wants yeah you have to you have to do your best to discourage your husband as much as you can you try to keep him away from these kind of things and at the same time if he's so adamant if he's not going to give them up then you have to become a little less attached to your husband <laughs> you have to just simply serve him out of duty but within your heart you have to be attached to krishna right prabhupad gives the example about the wife who is serving her husband and she's but at the same time the wife has another she has another another lover you know like a a secret affair so she doesn't want her husband to know she wants to keep her husband but at the same time she's having an affair with another man so she's very careful to do her duty very nicely to keep the house very clean and to cook the nice meals for her husband and not to argue with the husband like that to keep a good relationship with the husband because she doesn't want the husband to know that she has a secret so the same way a devotee wife is like that you know you have krishna and krishna is like this special lover who you've got you know he's the the, the special except the other man aside from your legally married husband so you're having a relationship with krishna secretly but you you know you keep it in your heart and you do your home keep your home do your housework do your duties as a wife very carefully so that your husband doesn't know so that he, he doesn't get disturbed 
Because if all the time you complain to him and nag him that he doesn't want to change, then we'll make the marriage very difficult. So you just have to keep yourself quiet and at the same time cultivate the, your Krishna consciousness. Without him, he's not going to help you. So you have to, go, you, have to you know that he's not, he's not Krishna conscious and he doesn't want Krishna consciousness. So you go ahead on your own and become Krishna conscious. Hmm. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Prabhupada tells he had one sister, and his sister, she was married to a man who was of very bad habits. But his sister was a very soft, gentle-hearted woman, and she never complained and she never nagged him or anything. And she just faithfully served her husband. And gradually the husband completely changed. He gave up all his bad habits and became very devoted to his wife, to serving his wife. He gradually began to appreciate that he had a very good wife and he would simply serve his wife and associate with the wife. And he gave up all of his drinking and other bad habits which he had. So that's one way. I'm sorry, Maharaj, I had a, a connection of it was was caught i didn't understand what, what she she has done the sister of Raupad, to get her husband changing yeah. habits because i was well caught, she, I was just, she was just serving him very nicely okay oh. but she never nagged him she never complained to him she just simply was very faithful and chaste and very obedient and she gave her husband so much service so the husband just changed he un gradually he understood that he was so lucky to have such a nice wife. <laughs> so it's one way to influence the husband. may not work for every man, but <laughs> for some men, you know, hopefully gradually people change as they become a little older, they become a little more sober, a little more mature. You know, the young men, they want to, they're thinking about enjoying life and things. But gradually they become more sober and more responsible. Isn't it true? About me, it's completely true, yes. <laughs> But Guru Maharaj, for a husband who doesn't have a devotee wife, uh, uh, they don't have to try so much, right, Guru Maharaj? They can take sannyasa? I mean, <laughs> oh, the man's a devotee, but the wife is not? Yeah. Well, yeah, well, certainly Prabhupada took sannyas. And Prabhupada said if the home life is not favorable, then he may have to leave the home and take sannyas, yes. It may be possible. But he has to be qualified. He has to have studied. He has to practice Krishna consciousness. He must have developed some uh, renunciation from the world. And of course, if the children are there, then the responsibility is there for the children. Children should be grown up, otherwise they're still depending on the father. We see Prabhupada did take sannyas, he left the home because he found the home life was no longer favorable for his practice of Krishna consciousness. 
people were they were giving uh, the whole family were just giving him problems he was always trying he was always trying to make the family krishna conscious but they were not interested and then one day even his books went missing and he didn't know where they'd gone and nobody would tell him where they'd gone and so he thought you know it's time to leave home so he went to vrindavan and he stayed in Vrindavan for some time and he was working there, doing some writing for the devotees, different articles and newspapers which the devotees were printing. And then he, he, you know, he was having dreams that his guru was coming to him and telling him he had to take sannyas. So he approached one of his god brothers and his god brother told him, yes, this is good, you should do it. So he accepted sannyas. But he was, he was 60 maybe at the time. Yeah, he was about 60. Not young man. Of course, people are too young. It's also difficult. <laughs> They're too young. You know, when you get a little older, you may decide you don't want to be a sannyasi. <laughs> We have that, we've seen that in ISKCON sometimes. Some young men take sannyas and then later on, somehow they get a bit older, they decided they don't want to be a sannyas. <laughs> they want to be married or something. So, Guru Maharaj, does that mean uh, if if they take sannyas in a very young age and later on they regret their decision, does that mean that their chanting was not effective or, or what does it mean? Yes, yeah, certainly there's something wrong there with their practice that there maybe you could say they're maintaining material attachment. They didn't somehow they yeah their chant as you could say as you said their chanting was it didn't didn't have the purity or the power to free them from worldly desires hmm. because uh the similar kind of thing happened with me uh you know as i was trying to convince one of my friend to join krishna consciousness she forwarded me the similar kind of incident. I think it happened somewhere in Africa. I, I don't know really. So she said, oh, well, how come you say that Krishna consciousness is good when these kind of things are happening? But at that time, I did not have any answer for that. So I stayed quiet. But I just told her if it, it, it depends on person to person. What, what, did, what did she say happened? Uh, the, the situation just said something like a uh, similar kind of situation has happened somewhere in Africa, maybe some sannyasi. Uh, even I, I don't know. She just showed me on internet, which I don't believe because sometimes internet spreads bogus news as well. Well, it happens everywhere. It doesn't just happen only in ISKCON. Yes, absolutely. It happens in other organizations also. They do have these problems, you know. Which in ISKCON, they do try to take care nowadays they do have a lot of things requirements before people are allowed to be a sannyasi in ISKCON. In Srila Prabhupada's time it was the beginning of the movement so Srila Prabhupada wanted some sannyasis to help him to establish the Krishna consciousness movement so he gave sannyas to some people who were very young you know some people in their 20s you know and even like Jaipataka Swami here in Mayapur, he was, I think, 19 when he took sannyas. You know, very young, you know, to take sannyas at that age, you know, really Absolutely. difficult. We hear about, of course, Sankaracharya, he took sannyas when he was six, I think. <laughs> they are saintly people. I think they are just born to take sannyas only. <laughs> they just appear to take sannyas. Yeah. <laughs> no. So, uh, it, it's really not for young men, that's the point. Although it was in, you know, like a thousand years ago, it was common. And you do have sometimes bala sannyasis in some places like 
you know, you may have somebody born in a special family and they check his chart and, oh yeah, he's definitely a sannyasi and, you know, they make him a sannyasi when he's very young. But in ISKCON, we, they have some rules. You know, one should be, you know, maybe at least 40, at least 40 years of age. And uh, he should be freed from family responsibilities. He shouldn't have any responsibilities. He may have been married before. He may have had children, but the children should, should be, you know, they shouldn't be depending on him. These kind of things. And he must also be well qualified. He must have practiced Krishna consciousness very well, studied the philosophy and be very uh, well uh, aware of the knowledge of the, the Shastra. And he should not be attached to, to material things like money and association with the opposite sex also. These things have to be controlled. Some people become very attached to money and then with money, then, you know, they think about enjoying with the women. So sometimes, sometimes that problem is there. But generally you get older people and do try to keep a check on things like, you know, the money which is coming and how it's being used and where it's going, all of these things. So yeah, we have had cases in ISKCON. We had some young people like that had problems. So you could say it's maybe it may, it's due to their spiritual practice. Definitely, it must be something there. They're doing something wrong. The chanting maybe not proper. Too much attachment. Too much involved. Sometimes get too much involved with managing and money and not enough time preaching. That's not good. And sometimes also too much time just with disciples and not enough time with your God brothers. You want to be more with, with your peers. You know, peers mean people who are on an equal level to you. You don't, just be, you don't just always want to be with people who are under you. Because if you're always with people who are under you, then, you know, they are always very respectful to you. But if you're with people who are your, your equals, then they will tell you, you know, you're doing something wrong. This is not right. Why are you doing like this? You know, they will tell you to your face. <laughs> Whereas the younger people, you know, they're reluctant to say anything that, oh, you're, you know, they don't like to say because they're thinking, oh, he's so senior. He's my senior. He's my guru or something. So they won't speak so directly. So it's important to spend time with people who are equals and even above you because they can, you know, really put you in your place. <laughs> and that's important to, because it's important to realize how insignificant we are, how we're nothing. We're very small. And we want to remember that. So humility, very important. So those are some things. Okay. So we should chant Hare Krishna now. Yes, Guru Maharaj. 